Hello Achievers, today I'm, I am with a new amazing guy, he will answer my question, he is the author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. If you don't know this book, you have to buy this book because it's so amazing. He is an inspirational, motivational speaker, trainer and also an entrepreneur. He, he sold 500 million of his book. He is Mark Victorans and he is with me to answer my questions. Hello Mark. Delighted to be here. How are you today? More than wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Can you show me, first of all, your story? I suppose, I never thought about it, but it, my mother was a great storyteller. Amazing. We go on a vacation, I come back and I go, she went on a better vacation, and I got four brothers, than, than we did. I don't know where she was, but it wasn't where I was. And I learned how great <laughs> a story was, you know, it was a pedestalic moment. And then I, I've listened to the great and inspiring speakers literally all over the world like you are doing right now, because I started when I was about your age. Yeah. And um, Jack and I got together, Dr. Canfield and I decided uh, to do this. It's a long story, so I'm going to be brief on it. Uh, we decided to do it. 144 publishers all said, hit the road, Jack. I said, look, it's okay if you don't like him, but I'm a nice guy. <laughs> That's not true. He's, Jack's great. But it was a funny line, I thought. Anyhow, uh, we had a little publisher take us, and they said, we'll do cartwheels if you sell 20000 and buy them at $6 each. So they were robbing us and um, continued to do that, as a matter of fact. But we sold the books, and then we said, I set all the goals for the company, right? I set inspirational, I, I did a whole set of tapes with Nightingale Clinical, how to think bigger than you ever thought you could think. So I said, we'll be the first ones ever to sell a billion books. Well, that's impossible, but you break it down and break it down and break it down. So we said we'd sell um, 150,000 by Christmas. We came out 20 years ago exactly, June 28th, uh, 1993. Uh, we sold that, and then we said we'd sell a million and a half in a year and a half. We did a million three in a year and a half, and not a million five. We said a million and a half in a year and a half. And then next year we said we'd sell five million and did, and then 10 million, and now we're at 500 million. And my goal is only halfway done. I'm going to, you know, I still think I'm young. I'm going to live to be 127 with options for renewal, so I got a long life ahead of me. My plan is to sell a billion books. Nobody's ever done it. Um, if you go online, you can find my critics say it's not doable because no one's done it. Well, Nobody ever ran a four-minute mile before Roger Bannister did, and when he did, 119 people did the next week. Well, I'll sell a billion books because I believe there's a new university that I think the world of Singularity University said everybody should have a project that positively affects one billion people. That's only one-seventh of our population, and in the next 20 years, our population goes to dangerously high, 12 billion. I'm not against people, but I am we'll talk about later, but I am for alternative energy. When energy goes up, industrialization goes up, population stabilizes. It's automatic. You don't need birth control. You don't need anything. It's just a different state of mind, but most people don't understand demographics. They don't understand a lot of stuff that, that yeah, I teach. We will talk about that. Very heady stuff. Um, I would like to know, because in the, in the book Success Principles, uh, Jack, tell a little bit about how did you convince him to work with him. I would like to... <laughs> Yeah, he told me I'm in that book 159 times. Good for me. I, I, uh, Jack and I have influenced each other. We've had a mentor-mentee relationship. Obviously, he went to Harvard, and I'm just a street kid who went to a public school and did pretty well and got with a lot of Harvard guys, studied with them. Um, I taught Jack how to do dramatic stories. We got a brand new 20th anniversary issue book. It turns out I was reading it last night, reading what Jack wrote, and I didn't get a chance <laughs> to edit it because we have different reflections on what happened. Which is true. I mean, you know, for the first, until 2,000 years ago, basically everyone knew the world was flat, right? And now suddenly in 1968, we have astronauts go in space, look back and say, oops, it's not flat, it's round, we're not going to fall off the edge of the Earth. So each of us is going to have his or her perception, and Jack... What is your perception that I would like my, to... My perception is that <laughs> I taught Jack how to do these stories because, you know, I had a great and inspiring teacher who was the dean of speakers, Cabot Robert, who I pedestalized. One of... I got... 44 super mentors, including Jack. And then Jack and I are sitting at a breakfast where he talked, and he had had people ask, you know, do you have that in a book? And it hit him in the head. But even when I read the story last night, the first stories were all stories I gave Jack. I thought, he found them, and I thought, that's not exactly accurate, Dr. Canfield. I found those stories, and then, you know, he said, I want to do this book, which had a silly title at the time, and I won't even go into that, because he doesn't like me to do that, because he doesn't cop to that, so... Um, 
more than you want to know, probably. So I said, let's do it together. And he said, well, I've got these 70 stories. I said, most of them I gave you. So let's look at it that way, pal. And, and so um, <laughs> let's do it together. He says, well, you find 26 more stories. Because when I was, I was a student ambassador at India, you see all those pictures on the wall. Um, we learned that 101 is a sacred number. And then when I was working on my doctorate, I was with the smartest guy, with this guy here, Bucky Fuller, with 15 doctorates from Harvard and everything writing, poetry, cosmogony, cosmogony, epistemology, stuff you never heard of. I never heard of. And I had a four point at the time and I thought, I never heard of any of those things when I studied and stayed with Bucky for seven years. Anyhow, um, I said, you know, one of the things in our, I'm a master of synergetic, energetic geometry, Bucky's mathematics, which is triangulation based. Anyhow, Bucky in numerics, you know, 101 is sacred. So I said, let's do 101. He said, give me 26 stories. So we did it and we put together the book. It took us about three years to, we wrote the model. And I said, we start with a, you know, we had to start with a, a discernment. And first of all, the f seven points. First one, it had to cause instantaneous behavioral change. So if you read it, it gotcha. <laughs> number, number two, it's got to cause goosebumps, God bumps, chili bumps. And then it goes through all those things. And so Jack and I sat there and did the model. And, and then we said, this is the, the road and these are the curbs. And you know, it's got to fit this to do it. And, and so we get a thousand stories and find one that would work for what our model was. And obviously the model worked because I'm sure we've had a billion readers because in China where I work and we sold 300 million books, in China our books passed along by about 12 people because there's no money. A free enterprise is just starting. It's only seven or eight years old. So it's a, it's a brand new phenomena and the people don't have money for books and there's not uh, bookstores, right, yet, except in Shanghai and Beijing. Not in Hangzhou and all those places don't have bookstores. They're electronically getting them a little bit. And in, in most Africa doesn't have bookstores except for a little bit of Kenya and a few places. Anyhow, so that's what happened. That's what we started and, and uh, we did it and, and we were a perfect dream team, which if yeah, you want to succeed, you've got to have a team together to get your dream together. And I would love to know, how did you manage your role in, uh, in this project? Did you do the same thing? How did you do? <laughs> now, Jack is an educator and I'm a business guy. And, and so we synchronized on what our skills were. Jack was a Latin scholar in, in high school and the top one in a place, a nowhere place called Wheeling, West Virginia. I came out of a nowhere place called Waukegan, Illinois. So we both came out of nowhere and decided to be successful. And then you know, he said, I don't know if we'll sell one or a million. I said, well, then let me do it because I've already written down we're going to sell not a million, but a billion. So let me decide the goals and, and get it going. And, and I'm a, I've been selling successfully, selling greeting cards and every other dang thing since I was nine years old because my parents were Danish immigrants, basically, and, and uh, didn't have a lot of money. So I had to buy my own clothes and everything. So I thought, well, I'll figure out how to sell this. And we decided to study all the best people. So I interviewed the 101 best-selling authors. Fiction and nonfiction. I mean, we did Scott Peck, who'd made $40 million, been 12 years number one with a book called A Road Less Travel. Great book everyone ought to read. And, and he said, do this. And so we put yellow stickies on a wall at Jack's office. And we had 1,094 to-dos from the best-selling authors, Dr. Wayne Dyer and Barbara DeAngelis and all of our dear friends, men and women and, and fiction, nonfiction, James. Wow, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was amazing. And, and we decided to write it as a business plan. And we still got kicked out of all those business offices. So they were not kicked out. They were polite, but they were, you know. And, and I thought, <laughs> God, all these guys, most of the people in New York went to Harvard, Yale, Wharton, or Stanford. And I thought, Jack is a superstar at Harvard. You know, they should accept him. We were at the Harvard Club and all that stuff that I thought I'd never get to, right? I got to visit, and then they offered me a job at Harvard once I became the world's best-selling author, and I said, 60? You mean a month? They said, no, a year. I said, I can't. I got my staff overheads two million before I open the damn door. I just can't afford to. You guys are, you're kidding. They said, I said, what do you get at Harvard? They said, prestige. I said, I promise you, all these people that you see in that picture there, they don't think eating prestige works for them and their family. I need real cash, so I'm not working teaching at Harvard. Wow. So I had to turn it down. But you know, I'm I'm in total admiration. Jack is a, a genius. He he. In answer to your question, I guess I went too far. Um, he is the best fine editor. When we hand in a book, in the old days we had to hand in a real book. Then suddenly we could hand in a disc. Now we just you know wire it to the publishers, and they never have to edit it again because Jack's good. And and his placement of stories was perfect. 
What he said to me was that I can read a story and say it doesn't flow, it doesn't flow. I can change all that and make it work because I'm pretty masterful at storytelling and, and not, not changing what you're saying, just change how it sequences and, and edit out stuff that is totally irrelevant. And so we put that together and then, you know, Jack is a master of putting together the books and, and I had all these contacts and like we designed the cover of this, you know, we paid for the cover that's called Design Dress. And it even, you know, even though it has sort of like a Campbell Soup, Campbell Soup became our partner because um, I'm really good at marketing. So Campbell Soup put us on 600 million Campbell Soup cans that you open up the label and had three stories inside and then it went, the money went, some of it went to charity. And then I said, look, Jack, if we're going to be big, we got to partner with the biggest. And he yeah. said, who are the biggest? So I said, well, the biggest are going to be Campbell Soup and, and Coca-Cola at the time. Now. Google is eight times bigger than them, and I'm doing some stuff with them. But but back then, this was the two biggest guys. And so with Coca-Cola, we were on the side of 50 million Diet Coke cases for six months. And we did what's called a sampler, a little book with three or four stories in it. And it was in the top of the Diet Coke case. And our research showed that Diet Coke people read books. Coca-Cola drinkers didn't read books. I thought, wow, that's interesting. So our book was on the side with <laughs> Nora Roberts. Her book was called... <laughs> hidden riches and our book was called Jack doesn't know any of this because he was never at those meetings I did all that I'm the marketing guy although reading his literature he says he's a marketing genius and I thought oh, I don't think so um, just you know you asked so I'm telling yeah. you what, what my position is you, I want to you you, a, you you asked Brian or anyone else anyhow so uh, our book was called uh, chicken soup for the romantic soul right which is a great title and we immediately went to number one because a lot of people don't read the newspaper, didn't see that we were number one. And if you look at the walls here, uh, we've been number one with Chicken Soup 58 times. And you say, well, wait a second, you got 258 titles. Why? Well, we're not going to be number one with Chicken Soup for the Canadian soul. We're number one in Canada. Singaporean soul, we're number one in Singapore for the last two or three years, right? They're not going to show up in the New York Times bestseller list because nobody in their right brain has figured out how to get a global list yet, including electronically. And I own the biggest electronic company for books in the world called Hanson House Publishing. Wow, <laughs> you are amazing. Uh, I would love to know. No, 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 I'm normal. Th that's the problem is that most people think the people that do something are amazing. Everybody's supposed to do something. Christ said you did you're amazing supposed to things. have a life that's <laughs> abundant. You're not supposed to hide your light under a bushel. You're supposed to let your radiant show. Mm. So I'm not here to, to amaze you. I'm here to say, hey, look, yeah. I want you to stand up, beat on your chest, and go do exalted things. Yeah, thank you, you and very I are supposed much to live in, in the, you know, metaphorically be kings or queens of our own life, dominion, and then go out and inspire others to do the same. Yeah, thank you to correct me about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 I, 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 because understand, you're still, you're here, here's the problem with that. If I get an audience to think, God, he's the most wonderful, what happens is they get less and I get to be more. That isn't the goal. The goal is that we got to get 7 billion people thinking on the planet. And that's your job and my job. As a speaker, your job is not only inspire them to wake up their greatness, but then get them to go out and inspire everybody else to wake up their greatness. Wow. Our job is not to be, damn, I'm good. You're supposed to be good, but you're supposed to help them find their greatness. divine destiny. Because most people are living below their privilege. And if you're living below, you can't help anyone even at level, much less above. And right now we got, no offense intended to the politicians in France and Germany, which I see on TV today being as dumb as our American politicians, which it is a, insults me. Because we've had great founding fathers that knew ethics, knew consciousness, knew awareness, and said, hey, look, we're going to make America the greatest country in the world. Right now, America is anemic. And I'm a proud American, but we got people that aren't thinking and aren't doing and aren't taking the right action because we can no longer think American-centric or French-centric or Chinese-centric. There's only one planet. We are humans, and we got to take care of all of us, and we got to quit polluting it because you say, well, <clears throat> in America, we had a town called Dodge City. You watch our cowboy movies with Clint Eastwood, who I just had dinner with a couple days ago, but we had... Uh, three feet of horse manure because they had no cleaning. So they moved the city 20 miles away. Like in Beijing, they're moving the city 400 miles. Dumb. It doesn't work. You can't move pollution. You've got to change pollution, not have it from the inside out. You change the thinking inside, and we'll change the world outside. 
Right now, people's thinking is, well, I'm going to grab it and get it for me, which is what the guys in Washington are doing. We've got 40,000 lobbyists and 400 leaders You go and a, one president, none of whom are thinking right, as far as I'm concerned, right? Because I say, if you ask the right question, I did a whole book with Jack called, you know, Aladdin <laughs> Factor, you know, which is basically you ask right and you get the right results. But if you ask stupid questions, you're going to get stupid results. If you ask questions, how do I get enough for me? And I don't care. I'm a congressman or senator. I'm going to get lifetime health care. But I think we ought to have health care for everyone. Hell no, we shouldn't have health care for everyone. Our goal, it, it starts in a preamble, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say happiness and pursuit. It doesn't say life, liberty, and health for everyone. No one can afford, I can't afford to feed you for the rest of your life or take care of your health. I don't know if you're going to take care of you. And we got Americans... 90 million Americans have diabetes because they're too friggin' lazy to exercise. I got up at 5.30 and exercised for an hour. I'm not responsible to you, but I'm responsible for me to be at 65, the healthiest guy you've ever seen. I can get done to 100 push-ups right now. Can you do 100 push-ups? Yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. I love what you're saying. You, you feel what you're saying. It's great. That's right. Well, that's what a speaker is supposed to do. Yeah. Is they're supposed to have a destination, but they got to have the inspiration and the perspiration to get to it. Mm, great. Because there's a lot of people that need to be uplifted, and we need a cellular upliftment now. And most speakers come and say, well, I'm going to get a big fee and walk in and talk, and maybe I'll sell some books and tapes. And that's great. No, it's great at one level, but it's not. The universe can't be grateful for you because we have a higher mission, a yeah, higher and Let's talk purpose. about that. Uh, According to you, what could be your advice to reach our goal for the people who are following us? Uh, how to reach a goal? Okay, well, if you're going to have a big goal, you got to have the macro, like you go into the cloud and say, okay, God, what is my divine destiny? And mine is to make the world work for 100% of humanity. So I'm going to do the best I can to inspire you. And then you're going to go back to France and you're going to uplift it. And maybe you'll hit some of the, the regular people, because I believe in bottom-up today marketing. Like I'm close friends with Dr. Muhammad Yunus, who one guy, in the poorest country in the world where nobody is eating, Bangladesh gets a hundred million women out of poverty. And he does great statements like poverty belongs in one place only, a museum. <laughs> we have no reason to be impoverished except we got people that are into greed and greed and avarice has no limits. We got to have people understand you got to get into an abundance consciousness to really have abundance. You got to be vibrating at that. And when you're vibrating at that, you attract it because there's more than enough for everybody for the first time ever on the planet, thanks to consciousness and technology. Okay. We so could grow enough food to feed everyone, and yet we got people starving. You see, oh God, <laughs> we, we have a charity tied to every book from the beginning of the book. And one of them is Feed the Children, which feeds a million kids supplemental yeah. food around the world our dear friend who's been in this office a lot, Larry Jones, because I handle the charity part of our business. And it just, you know, everybody needs to have a main business where they make enough money to take care of them and their family. And then they got to have what Muhammad Yunus teaches, a social business that just takes care of whatever the charities are that you believe in. And my, we got a couple of them, but I believe in economic freedom and economic literacy for all. So I'm teaching that and I have a foundation that does that and I have a company that takes care of We'll send you the clicks on all this. I got yeah. your email so I'll send you, I own the Richest Kids Academy because we've got to teach every kid to take their entrepreneurial dream and turn it into results. How to define a precise goal, do you understand me? Yeah, because a lot of people are setting goals but it's too blur. Yeah, too blurred. Too blurred. And yeah, how to do that to have enough uh, motivations to reach it? It's a great question, and, and goal setting is goal getting. So what I teach is you got to write at least 101 goals, and that's called a good beginning. I personally have, in writing, 6,000 goals. Now, there's only one other the human being that has over 6,000 goals in writing. And my goals are serious goals. I mean, like, you can see I climbed Machu Picchu, I've climbed Fuji, I've climbed Whitney, I've climbed Kilimanjaro. This, these aren't little goals. This isn't a goal that takes 10 minutes. Everybody needs set goals. I teach that you need at least 101 goals, and that's called a good start. Because you got to have health goals, family goals, social goals, spiritual goals, recreational goals. Goals that you know you can't achieve because goals have got to have three levels to them. they got to have the goal. Most people do anyway goals, which I call a C goal. <laughs> I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to go to work every day and I'm going to get my salary. I'm going to come home. I'm going to smash beer cans on my head and throw them in the back of the SUV and then go camping this weekend again with my wife and kids and neighbors and friends. Eh, you know you can do that. <laughs> B is a little bit of a stretch. It's 10, 20, 30% more. But you need to have some A goals, goals that you know 
are going to push you to the edge and the fiber of your being. You're going to go like one of our five kids just graduated cum laude here at University of California, Irvine. Another one's graduating dean list over at Chapman, which are good schools and hard schools. But my little daughter, you know, was screwing around in school that just graduated cum laude the first two years. And I said, we're taking you to a real school and you're going to get challenged by mostly Asians that have all been the best of class. And immediately it woke her up. Because unless you're doing A goals, unless if you, I play tennis, unless you play tennis with somebody better, you don't get better. Unless you're lifting weights with somebody that's stronger than you, you don't get stronger. Unless you start hanging out with people that are the best in class, world class, you don't get to be world class. And that's what you're doing right now. You're in yeah. interviewing all my peers who are unequivocally the best in class. I mean, everyone that you named on the phone is like a close friend. I mean, I got yeah. him in my cell phone. We're all I know that. <laughs> peers. And and we all, you know, know where each other's strengths and weaknesses are and can tell you. So the first step is to set A goals, right? Top goals that um, right. it's so important for you and you will have the motivation to take actions every day to reach it. It's got to be what you want with your heart started. It can't be what your mom wants, your dad wants, your boss wants, your supervisor, your manager wants. Got to be your heart's desire. Yeah. Like I wanted to speak and talk to people that care about things that matter that would make a life-changing difference. And I wanted to make a difference that makes a lasting legacy leaving difference with my words, my thinking, my communication, and the companies that I own and the businesses I participate in. Wow. This is a kind of statement you, you repeat every day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I own them, but in terms of my biggest goal is make the world work. And then, you know, how do you make the world work? Well, you got to have two things. You got to have enough energy, yeah. right? And you got to be able to do creative energy because of the laws <laughs> of thermodynamics. And then number two is you got to have enough education. And I'm part of a lot of universities, but the, the biggest university we're part of is probably going to be the world's biggest free university. And it'll probably have the first billion students ever called WE, World Education University in Palm Springs. And I was with the chairman yesterday and I said, here's what we got to do to make this thing work. And it's it's going to be really sticky. It's going to be a lifelong education. Everyone's going to do it. And it's, we're making education cool. Yeah. And, and, and most education is not cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking about topic I, I care about. So we will talk about kids after. <laughs> okay. What do you think about the people who have lack of self-confidence? Because do you think we can, we can set a top goal, a A goal without self-confidence? Everyone needs self-confidence. Self-confidence is self-confidence, self-generated. But it's generated, reflected on another person. Therefore, if Jack and I hadn't worked together as a mastermind team, I say when one and get one get together, they get the power of 11 if you look at that, right? Some days I had to inspire him because he wasn't feeling up to it. Some days maybe I wasn't up to it and he had to inspire me. But the goal was so big that we're going to have the world's best-selling series. That was a macro goal. Then it was broken down into little parts. So we're going to write the book. Then we're going to educate the book. Then we're going to do our own cover on the book. Then we're going to sell the book. And while everybody turned us down, I said, in the worst case, we'll sell it ourselves. We'll self-publish, which we would have been a lot more profitable. But we didn't see that at the time because it wasn't easy to do distribution. Today, anyone can distribute, but you've got to be able to create a platform. And then we said, well, you know, like I said, we'll sell this many and, you know, a million and a half, a year and a half, and then five million, 10 million, then 100 million. And then, you know, now half billion and we'll, I got all the plans written out to sell a billion. Nobody's, unless you show me something that I'm totally unfamiliar with, all the people you interviewed, not one of them have a plan written to sell a billion books. Not one. Why are you going Therefore, to? they won't sell a billion books. Why according to you? Why, Why according to me? Yeah. Well, Why by the way, if they did, they would have sold more books. Because the spiritual law is real clear. The Old Testament says, write a thing, make it clear, it shall be established on you shall, spiritually speaking, is definite certainly. If they don't have it written down, they're going to sell a billion or not. I, I know all the author's numbers that you know, you've interviewed, and yeah. some of them do a book a quarter, and some okay, of them do, so let's but not one of them even planned on selling a million. A lot of them, one of the women you interviewed was my house kiss for six hours a couple days ago. We started with breakfast with my wife and I and her husband and went forever, and she's a brilliant woman, but I said, show me your goals. She didn't have them. I can show you all my goals in writing, and you need to carry your goals with you, wrapped in a $100 bill. And because I think the highest <laughs> color is purple, 
you know, you why? S- and you can see that these are red every day. And why it says, is it purple? It's, purple's the highest color of God, right? If you look at the rainbow, the top of the rainbow is always going to be purple because it's the highest color in the electromagnetic spectrum. Your website it's, is purple. Yeah, of course. <laughs> it's purple and yellow, highest two colors. So I'm so happy, and then it goes through very specific goals that are signed by my wife and I. And you look at this at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and before you go to sleep at night. Most importantly, before you go to sleep at night, because your subconscious never sleeps. And originally it was how many books we're going to sell and how we're going to sell them, and now it's got some other issues with it. But, you know, the point is that if you don't have goals in and writing yeah. and can show them to me, they're useless. You yeah. say, I got them in my mind. No good. Okay, I'm writing a book uh, on self-confidence. because I was shy. and No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was shy. And <laughs> so let's By the way, you ought to write that's your subtitle, I was shy. Uh, it's a sub- <laughs> it, it would be See, a good- title has always got to be heart. Subtitle has got to be head. I think your title has got to be I was shy because shy, I don't know what percentage of people are shy, but I'm going to say 40%. I'll just pick up a number, 30%, whatever. But what happens is when you're shy, <laughs> you live less than your full privilege that I've been talking about. Yeah, uh, it, it was the case. And you felt bad about yourself. And yet you're good looking. You've got bright, shiny eyes. You're obviously very smart. You know, you're hip. You got it together. And you're French. I mean, how do you do that? Right? <laughs> I'm French. So if I, if I have to do a plan for this book to sell 1 million books in, in France and then 10 million books in, in worldwide when I will translate it, what, why I have to, do, to put in my plan to do that? And do you suggest to interview also bestseller? Interview all the best-selling authors and ask how we did it. But you don't need to know how to write because you can get editors cheap. You can get university people cheap. You can get freelance and elance and I dictate and all that stuff's available for n- basically no money. So don't co-author unless you need a co-author to write with. Now, Jack and I need to co-author and be 50-50. But the point is because we helped each other and, and we you know, did sweat yeah. equity and we both put up 140 grand to make it happen because our publisher gave us zero, didn't pay for publicity, didn't. He now says, I did all this. <laughs> Anyhow, so you plan on doing it yourself and if you do it yourself, keep the direct mail database. Database is everything, that's saleable. That's tr- and make sure you own the trademark. Mm. Like I Was Shy is a heck of a good title for a book. Yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't know, self-confidence won't sell. There's a lot of books out in self-confidence that doesn't sell. Go look at them. I can name four authors that got self-confidence books, zero sales. Wow. So according to you, it's, I, I don't have to, to write a book on self-confidence? No, no, no. You need to write it. And you need to do it. And here's the one, two, three, if you do Brian Tracy, seven or 700 principles of self-confidence. Why make it three, that? make it three, make it easy, and then do subsets. Make it so easy, because if you make it simple, then people will do it. If you make it hard, what did I do? I just said, do a three by five card, right? I'm so happy, because you're programming yourself all the time. I'm so happy, I'm going to write a book on self-confidence, I'm going to have it done by here, I'm going to sell a million within a year. Don't give yourself more than a year. Why would you? Because your subconscious figures out how to do whatever you believe you're going to do. Yeah. And then like you see pictures of all the stuff I'm going to do, like on this magazine cover and that. You do, Jack and I did a picture. We wiped out, you know, um, Dr. Scott Peck's name, put, you know, Chicken Soup of the Soul on the New York Times bestseller list and that it was Mark and Jack. And we did that and I put it up at Jack's mirror in his office. My mirror in my office is here. My home and Jack's home. I did all that because the subconscious believes your mind is all images. So if your image is that I'm shy, you stay shy. So one of the three principles has got to be how to control the images in your mind. You got to change the images to I'm resolutely strong. I can stand <laughs> in front of an audience. I will not crumble. Because you're going to have, I'll just tell you in advance, you're going to, ha- you're going to sit with somebody. Like the first guy I'm sitting with to speak, I say, how are things going? He said, it couldn't be worse. I lost two million dollars. I'm laughing now. I shouldn't be laughing. I lost two million dollars yesterday. My wife left me. She took everything in the house is empty. And I, I'm going, oh my God. Because I was empathetic rather than sympathetic. Empathetic, sympathetic and empathetic. If you're in a rocking boat and you're and somebody's throwing up and you're sympathetic, you can help me. You can go get them anti nausea pills, ginger or something, or the bracelets today really work. Right, because it uses your acupuncture points. <laughs> but, but if you 
empathize, you start to throw up too. That doesn't do that guy any good. <laughs> and and I wanted, I thought, I gotta go talk to 200 people and this guy just told me the world's caving in. We're in a recession, there's no hope. And I'm going, oh my God, I think I, I, because I wasn't strong enough yet to go to lead an audience when somebody led me down like that. So you always gotta make sure especially when you go to talk, you put up your shield, just like a medical doctor, if he or she is smart, they put up their shield, especially on college. We did a book on chicken soup for the surviving soul, all the ways to, 101 ways to be cancer. Now doctors don't like it because we say laugh your way healthy and they go, oh my God, that'll kill our business. We can't sell chemo <laughs> with that, a dumbass. Anyhow, they, if they had integrity, they would sell our book and give it to everybody. We still sell 20,000 every week, you know, ongoing because everyone's getting cancer because they're so dumb they believe they should get cancer. I don't believe I should get anything. I don't get sick. Why would you program to get sick? Why would you program to be shy? Somebody told you you're shy. Your mother, father, brother, uncle, aunt. Yeah. You know, the minister, priest, rabbi, whoever the hell it was <laughs> said, you are shy. What? Excuse me, God, are you talking to me? <laughs> you see, and you need to make fun of being shy yeah. now that you're out of shy. Yeah. It's but you need to also grab everybody's hand in the audience that's shy because they don't want to be shy. They don't want to hide behind a curtain. They don't want to wet themselves if they got to go up and talk or do a board meeting. They don't want their knees to go like this. And, and the minute you get to speaking and understand it's not you, you're doing it for them, then it doesn't matter. The guy can say whatever he said. His, his business went to hell. Too bad for you, pal. You just If you really listen today and you learn to think right, talk right, act right, you're going to get the right results right here and right now, and we can rebuild your business. You start today. Because there is no tomorrow. The only time your vibration alive is now. Yep, you were alive when you were born, but you can't be there except in memory. So the only thing we got is right now. What are we going to do with now and we're going to re-vector? Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, it's great. And it's the same for shy. It's the same for getting rid of alcoholism, drug abuse, poverty, bankruptcy, sickness, low life. <laughs> Everything. Yeah, being a whore, whatever it is. I mean, you can get out of it. I'm not, not saying any of that isn't, wasn't true, but that's yesterday. Now, what are we going to do today? Yeah. Um, just before you said me that you discovered 40, 40 points of co common points of each bestseller, I would love to know maybe 10 common points you, you saw uh, on bestseller. You know, obviously you got to have a magnificent title. And so Jack and I went into our respective meditations. We've been studying uh, er Dr. Eric Erickson, the psychiatrist, hypnotherapist. And he said, give yourself a thought command. Same thing Napoleon Hill did. And I'm sure you read Think Grow Rich. Yeah, right? yeah it's yeah. amazing. Napoleon Hill was going to have the first title, How to Make a Boodle with Your Noodle, which is a stupid title, and it wouldn't have sold. So his publisher said, come up with a title at 2 o'clock. He kept saying, best-selling title. So Jack and I said, you know, uh, we said, I think the cliche was a monster best-selling title. We each said it 400 times. We said we'd wake up at 4 o'clock. And you know, then we came out. Chicken soup is in a, in the United States is yeah, what your I mother or father that. gives you when you're sick to get well, right? Or grandma or whoever. And <laughs> and uh, now we sell soup. We own chicken soup, and we're in 2,700 grocery store chains right now around the world. So we're becoming. Originally, we were subset of Campbell. Now we own our own. So it's going to be a big business. It's one of the. I got us into licensing because I said. You know, the only way you're going to market is if you license. Like we sold $168 million worth of dog food last year, chicken soup that sold dog food. And <laughs> one of my daughters becoming a vet, she's an evolutionary biologist, and the guys from Diamond Pet Food came here and they said, well, we want to do this. I said, well, look, I got 88 animals on my land here and, and this daughter can heal any animal, but here's the rules. I got four dogs out of all these animals. We got a little heavy in chickens. Um, number one, it's got to be organic. Number two, the dog has to like it. Right? Just what you asked what the rules are. Whoops, I jumped from titles. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I see I went too far. I'll go back. I'll go back. I, I at least never forget anything. How's that? And when I drive away in a few minutes, I'll go, I should have told them this. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and I have fun all the time. Because your life purpose is to be in joy. And same with every speaker and all the people. Anyhow, so we, we said you got to do all this stuff because... Purina, I'd just been with Purina, the world's biggest dog food maker, and they had the best packaging, the best looks, the best placement, the best sales force. They got it everywhere. They had the best advertising, and it went to number one one month. The second month, it came to zero, and the, man, the president comes in and says, why didn't it work? He said, the dogs don't like it. <laughs> so I said to him, it's got, the dog's got to like it, and now we're becoming the number one dog food. 
Because our animals, all, all four dogs love chicken soup for this old dog food. And everyone who buys it, the price is lower, the packaging's better. All that stuff has to be there, but you've got to have a product that people like. Now, back to the book. Why did I go there? Because we had a book that we knew would work. We tested the book. We got feedback on the book. When we did our third book with Jack's sister, Kim Kerberger, we tested it against 12,000 kids at Nickelodeon. That's big here. It may not be in Europe. I don't know if Nickelodeon. But we said to the kids, here's the 250 stories that Jack and I have read, 1,000 stories to find each one of these. These stories are kids' stories. Tell us what works, doesn't work. Be critical. And like we said, this means call your mother. And the kids crossed it off and said, don't moralize to us. So we said, whoa, didn't see that coming. So we're not, we crossed that off. Do not call your mother. <laughs> we didn't put that in there. And, and nobody gets that kind of feedback because an author, so we learned from Ken Blanchard, who taught Jack at Harvard. Doctor, did you interview Dr. Blanchard? No, I would not. Yeah, you can call Kenny, Dr. Blanchard to you and, and say that Mark and Jack sent you. It'll be fine. But Jack went to Harvard with him and... Bill Cosby and Al yeah, Gore, Jack's older Ken, than Ken, amazing also. <laughs> yeah, he's amazing. He's the best parable of storytelling. But Ken said, boy, at breakfast, he told us, breakfast is, uh, sorry, <laughs> feedback is a breakfast of champions, right? So he had 12,000 kids read Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul and say, this paragraph works, this doesn't make any sense, this isn't clear to me. Wow. And I went back, Jack went, I edited the first, Jack edited the second. We made it perfect. Now you say, well, how good is perfect? We sold 19 million the first year. Now our publisher said, I got kids and they buy, uh, let's see, they buy uh, CDs, concert tickets, and clothes. They ain't buying your book. Well, we sold 19 million books. Hello? Every time he said it wouldn't work, it worked. So I was glad. I mean, I said, I said, Jack, this is barometer. Forget what he said. Listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> Listen to what 12,000 kids said. They said this is going to be the hitter of all times. Why? Because kids had nothing to talk about. So what you want to do is you want to go after the shy market. And you want to go after the shy market at different age discriminations. You want to do it by gender discriminations. And there are not only two, male and female, <laughs> In our country, you've got TV shows that show there are all kinds of genders, right? I mean, you know, so you can go look at all those. And, but, but start with female because they buy all the books, then do male. And then do it age appropriate, at, you know, 25 to 45, and then go just, you know, I was shy in, uh, how to handle it if you're shy in college. How to handle it if you're a shy in high school. How to handle it if you're shy in junior high school. How to hire if you're shy in elementary school so you can handle a bully that is obviously going to be attracted to you because you're shy. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so when you're doing a title, when you're doing a book, you have to have your discernments. We said the title. We said you've got to have the subtitle. And uh, you've got to have feedback before yeah. the do book because most books are edited by an editor and the author. Not enough. Two people can't. You want it edited by the marketplace. Nickelodeon was our marketplace. It was kids. And the kid, teenage kids. I mean, age appropriate from uh, 11 to 17. And, and they said, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And choo, 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 get rid of it. And we scaled it on a scale of 1 to 10. And we didn't do anything in the book that wasn't a 10. Now, we wanted 10 plus, 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 which is a story that you remember for the rest of your life. Like when you're reading Jack's book, he says, Puppies for Sale, which I gave him. You know, it was written by our dear friend Dan Clark, but Dan and I were close friends, and, and Dan did a lot of stuff with us. And, and the point is, you hear that story. I can tell this story to you now. I, I know all the chicken soup stories. And that's one of the things that always amazed Jack. He said, how the hell do you remember every word? I said, we both read them seven times. I mean, how the hell do you not remember? He says, because I put my mind on the next thing. I said, no, it's not it, Jack. You are looking for punctuation and grammar, which is critical because you'll get to do that. But I'm looking for story. A, a book is a book, but then there's the print in the book. Then there's the understanding of the book. Then there's the abstraction understanding of the book in a comprehensive cosmic sort of way. That's my strength, is abstracting it and saying, does this stuff work? Is it congruent? Is there a marketplace for this? Like we we're told the cancer book wouldn't sell. And it just keeps selling because people with cancer that are smart, most aren't smart about it. They go to the doctor and say, I surrender. I got a tumor. Kill me with chemo. And you go, how the hell stupid are you? Right? Chemo kills almost everybody. And every cancer doctor, the first line we have in the book is, every cancer doctor, 100% die of cancer. Why? The cliche, I write a, a, a quote every day, and I recommend that to you. But one of them is, what you think about comes about, right? 
in the Old Testament, it says, as a man or woman thinketh in his or her heart, or deeper in innermost subconscious mind, so is he or she. Well, if you think about cancer, what are you going to die of? Duh. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you go, do you want to go to somebody that's going to die of the thing that you're going to get cured? No, you want to go to somebody that's a healer. Does that make sense? Yeah. You want to go to somebody that's healed shyness. That's you. I didn't, I wasn't shy. You can see that. Matter of fact, I'm bombastic. <laughs> I'm just the opposite of the shy. Or yeah. shy in a former life, maybe. You are, you <laughs> <laughs> see, what chicken soup is, is it's so simple stories. Now, we write for kids. We write for people at a seventh grade level. Now, Jack and I are both doctors, but we write for people that are, that don't get it. And we don't use the word doctor, except I tell you he's a doctor because I want you to make sure when you talk to Canfield or Kenny Blan Dr. Ken Blanchard that you have respect because at the, you're not a doctor yet, are you? No. You haven't got a PhD. And yeah, so the, the point is you need to go in with respect. But the point I'm saying is we don't put doctor on because my minister, Dr. Norm Vince Peel, a guy who sold 25 million in the first year of power of positive thinking, Peel said, look, if you put that on there, you sell 25% less. Now, understand, 25% less of 500 million books is 125 million books. I can't afford not to sell that many books. I, I, it just is bad business, and I'm the business guy, so, right? And very proud of it, because an entrepreneur takes low value and makes it high value to the marketplace, to the future. They create a fortune for themselves and, uh, and help everybody. Because wow. the most unselfish thing to do is be very successful. Right. Selfish people are unsuccessful and are tight and stingy. I'm a lot of things, but... I'm generous and and because I know I'm going to create more. Yeah, and uh, I would like to start to, to talk about kids and youth. Do you have some life lessons you would like to share to youth to succeed in life and become happy in this life? I, I won the Horatio Alger Award, which you win in the U.S. Supreme Court, and you get it with Judge Clarence Thomas, which is this is the highest court in America, and it's a gold medal, and I got it upstairs and all that. I can get it out and show you, but. What we do is, is, it means you've come from rags, meaning no money, to riches, which I have, and getting richer. But we've been very philanthropic. Philanthropic means you have the love of humanity and you take care of your fellow man. Because the Bible in Acts 1.8 says, first take care of yourself, then take care of your spouse if you have one. Then you take care of your kids, right? And by the way, this is a responsibility that most people don't get. Nobody's teaching what I'm telling you, and this is high spiritual law. Then you take care of your business, then your city, then your community, then your state, then your country, and, and I'm in a place I want to take care of the world. And I'm in a place that what Solomon, the richest guy of all times, at least biblically speaking, the first trillionaire, 20,000 ships, 12,000 horses, a lot of wives, a little busy, <laughs> even had a black wife, which really surprised the rest of the rabbis, I'm sure, Queen of <laughs> Sheba. <laughs> she came up, you know, a brilliant woman who was smart enough to ask him the question, you know, how do you look through sand? Do you know how to look through sand? That was their first question. You can't. You can't? Glasses are sand. <laughs> Silicon chips are sand. So sand has become the most abundant element and it's useful. Anyhow, so the point is, Solomon said in Psalm 72, your job and mine yeah. is to be an influencer of influencers. I'm trying to influence you, but your goal you're going to influence millions of people, not even a question, because you're going to do really good edits on this film, right? Yeah. And then you're going to go out and, and promote it. I'll use a simple word. I was going to say promulgate, but I, I don't want to stretch your brain too much with English words. And I understand. <laughs> if I was trying to do it in French and I spoke French, which Sprechen Sie Deutsch and Hindi Urdu and a few other languages, Danish, but um, not French very well. <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> I only had one quarter. Um, the, the point is, is that you know, you're supposed to have fun with this thing, but you're going to influence millions. So I am influencing you to influence other influencers. Yeah. And if I influence you right and say, hey, wait a second, we ought to really take the high road. How is it I take good care of myself, but then we take care, good care of the world? Because most people say, well, I took care of myself and my family, so I'm done. No, you're not done. And most Americans are in debt, so they're not done. Because unless you're <laughs> debt free, you're not stress free and set free. <laughs> Most Americans think, well, my credit card still has a limit and I still got checks so I can write checks. And you go, no, I mean, I own this whole building, but it's debt free. I don't owe anyone any money on this building. I own this. I'm going to sell it someday, but right now it's worth a couple million bucks, right? But you just, the, the point is, is that you're going to influence a lot of people. So my influencing you is more important than my going to talk to a thousand people today. 
Because mm. you're going to go talk to a million. And if I've had an effect on you, even that much, so a sentence gets to a higher ground, you're going to affect a million people that take them to a higher ground, as are my peers. I think, I really believe, of all the professions in the world, the speaking and writing professions are two of the noblest. I mean, I think it's important to make money, and I make a lot of it, but I don't think that's an end. The important thing is how do we source and serve people to take them to a higher, better, more inspired, healthier, happier, more joyous, fully alive, so they manifest their destiny. Mm. Because the, the most wealth in the world is in a graveyard. People that didn't sing their song, didn't write their story, didn't create their business, didn't find the person that they love so much that their heart aches for that person. I have two last questions for you. How to become a loser according to you? Do you have some advice? Jack and I, uh, <laughs> when we went to New York to sell <laughs> What do you have to do to become a loser? Yeah, I'm going to answer it. I'm answering it. But we did a, we were going to do a book on that actually. We, we sat in my jacuzzi years ago and drank wine and wrote 137 titles and we wrote, I'd written a book called Dare to Win which Berkeley bought from us, we redid it, he did a little to it and we we're going to do Dare to Win, Dare to Lose and so we did have that title all the way to number 14 in that series was going to be called Dare to Know God. Because when you're writing a book, you ask me for the principles, one of the 10 principles of the 38 is don't do anything you can't sequel and prequel, meaning do before and do after. Like Indiana Jones, one, two, three, four. Star Wars, one, two, three, four. When I read the books by George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, I just told you way back in the conversations, yeah. shyness for elementary school, shyness for junior high, shyness for high school, college, shyness for adults, shyness for 80-year-olds, shyness for octogenary, octogenary means 80-year-old, nine in a, uh, anyhow, you got it. Centurion yeah. means 100-year-old. There aren't many of them, so don't write that first. <laughs> <laughs> So I dare to lose. Yeah. You, you lose by, first of all, not seeing yourself having full potential. You lose by not writing down magnificent goals. You lose by not having a dream team, a mastermind team. Like Jack and I would stand back to back while we were under attack by the publisher, under attack by the media, under attack by our spouses. Because my ex-wife said, you spend so much time with Jack, why don't you marry Jack? And I go... <laughs> I, don't, I like Jack's intellect, but I have no interest in marrying Jack. We're just trying to finish a project that is a penultimate of projects, a project that desperately needs to get done because we're going to go serve a billion books and hopefully that will affect seven billion people in a positive, uplifted way. Because the book was written, in case you don't get with Jack, for the wounded heart. And everybody has a wounded heart, 100%. So the person with the most wounded heart calls him or herself a loser and says, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. I'm not capable. I don't have any talent. I don't have any dreams. But this morning I was watching a video while I was exercising hard and then I did a little yoga, but I'm watching this video of a guy that broke his neck who's a great speaker. You ought to interview him, Chad Hymas. His dad takes him up to another girl but when he was a champion basketball player and makes him sit down with this woman who's drooling and is also broken her neck before he broke his neck, 12 years before, and said, do you have a mother? He said, yeah, I love my mother. Do you have a father? No father. Goes on. But the fourth question was, do you have a dream? And now Chad was captain of the basketball team and successful and good looking and had a C in the back of his letterman coat. I don't know if they do that in your country. When somebody's good at sports, they give you a, a $500 jacket out of leather with a letter on it. But his yeah. had the letter C, and his dad said to this handicapped girl who can't talk or move with cerebral palsy, said he thinks that C means he's cool. Wow. And he says, what's your dream? And she said, my dream is to be a cheerleader. Now she's totally handicapped. She can't even move in her wheelchair except to go like this and make the wheelchair move. But because Chad's dad was a great father, said to his son, who's the captain of the team, said, you will get the cheerleaders to do this, and puts his hand on his son's hand as a real father and a real leader and said, you'll get it done, won't you, boy? 
And she got to have little pom-poms in her wheelchair and go like this and put one in her mouth and go like that to cheer for the basketball team. She got to live her dream because a healthy guy didn't look down on unhealthy people. You as a healthy guy are going to get a million people that are shy out of being shy. I grail you to pull it off. You're going to let them release that hidden splendor. The inventions that can't come out unless they wake up to their trueness. The songs, the books, the businesses, the hopes, the dreams, the love. You're going to release it. Yeah. Because <clears throat> nobody's a loser. Yeah, I think so. And one of the companies I'm working with right now, just in America to prove that, it's a big company. It's a billion-dollar company that I'm a principal in. And, and um, I said to the chairman, I'm not the chairman, I'm just a director. I said, look, we have 14 million blind people in America. Only 17% of them can get jobs. That's not okay. We're going to take them in. And if I'm on your board, we're going to do teach everything in Braille. And because of me, we're doing it. We have 3.5 million people that are in wheelchairs. Now, my son is head of military intelligence over in Afghanistan right now. So I've seen a lot of his people. My daughter, he, he's my son-in-law actually, had to had give away 350 flags for his guys that died in Afghanistan. So this is a major player who's military intelligence. I said, these guys have come back with no limbs because of Iraq, Afghanistan, and maybe an imbecile in North Korea who now wants to negotiate with us, which I hope happens. We got to be able to hire those military guys. They were brave, served. <laughs> had kids and families to come back to and they can't get a job because nobody will hire somebody that's an amputee or a quadriplegic. Quadriplegic means you got no arms or legs yeah. left. We're doing that. I've got jobs for them now. You and I are here to influence people at level as you can. And I'm saying that you ought to do a book on shy for the blind. There's a niche. I, I did the book with the world's greatest marketer. You're interviewing Jay Abraham? No. Jay and I wrote a book. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll give wearing. you his phone number. But Jay and I wrote a book called How to Grow Rich in Your Niche. And there's a niche nobody's looking at. And I tell you, go after the niches that no one will touch. Why not talk to the blind? Why not talk to the 100 million people that can't even afford a wheelchair because nobody will get them out of their shyness so they crawl around in their bellies because they can't get a wheelchair? Do we have big problems? There are no losers, just people that haven't been inspired by you. Last question? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>